fine. So um, this uh, circle is, um, uh, don't worry about the details of it, but what it represents is uh, an integration, if you like, of how we understand cancer today. And it's really to show that there are a number of processes that change a cell in our bodies, we're made of billions of them, into a cell that starts to divide when it shouldn't. And one of the problems is that, that cancer is a representation of human life. It's, it goes hand in hand. It's, and it's, it's uh, inevitable if we all live to 120. And so we have to accept that cancer is not going to disappear. In fact, it's going to increase in incidence overall, particularly as we get older. And that it presents a huge number of challenges because we're trying to control something that is inherently our own. And where we are after 50 years of really high level research is these, this idea that we have a number of, of key processes that all integrate to make the cancer cell. And they've been given interesting sort of symbols. Uh, now, more recently, it has been the re recognition that that cancer cell communicates with the other cells in the body, including the immune cells of the body uh, here, the inflammatory cells of the body, and a whole series of mechanisms to do with each us, of us as an individual in the way we handle these mistakes that happen in cancer cells, and how we then feed that cancer in terms of its nutrition. So these are fairly logical, but each one of these pathways <coughs> now presents a potential mechanism of attacking a cancer. Now, this uh, knowledge is at variance for what's happening in the pharmaceutical industry, which uh, in our society has been really very important in developing new drugs and treatments. And uh, it's a fact that it takes 20 years to get a drug from the idea into the clinic so it can be given to patients. And uh, one of the problems is the attrition of these interesting new targets that target these pathways I've just shown you to get into the first clinical trials in human and then actually to get into, into clinical practice. And it takes somewhere along the lines of at least a billion dollars to do that. And, but the big attrition is here, this first in man switch. How can we be smarter about making those drugs more effective. And so how can we be smarter is to personalize that drug. Now that's, we are all different and that means straight away that all our cancers, if we develop them, are gonna be different. And so even though we may have Ewing sarcoma or osteosarcoma, each one of our osteosarcomas or Ewing sarcoma is gonna be different from the other one. But there will be common features. And so, traditionally, the drugs have really been pushing what happens in terms of how we judge clinical benefit. And for many years, uh, common drugs were given to all types of histologies, and there wasn't a breakdown in terms of the specific treatments that would tailor to the specific diagnosis. But there's a new technology coming in called omics, and so one of the future directions is going to be how to bring omics, which I'll talk to you about in a minute, into the future of cancer care, and particularly in bone cancer. Now, one way to think about the future of medicine, which is what we're talking about, is to think of it around the patient. And so the future, one future direction is how do we predict whether somebody's going to get a Ewing sarcoma or an osteosarcoma? Is there something about the constellation of genes and changes in our own in our own bodies, the environment we live in, that makes us higher risk of developing a sarcoma than somebody else? And can we identify with these new tools those patients? Because if we could identify them, we could screen them and be very careful about their exposure to radiation or introduce a preventative agent. So that's blue sky, but that's, that's the idea of prediction. Can we then actually use that knowledge to introduce a prevention. Now, you can't take all the bones out, but you could uh, potentially uh, screen very intensively and introduce some drugs. 
And then if the disease does appear, how do we make the treatments tailor better to the patient as a whole and to the tumour specifically? And that is called personalisation of medicines. And finally, participatory was what we're doing here, was to make absolutely sure that the questions we're asking are the right ones. Because no research is good unless it's asked, answering the right questions. So this participatory element is essential. So this is the complexity of where we are in terms of all the different types of sarcomas. There may be over 100 different types just by their appearance, <coughs> and there are many subsets even of those. So at the moment, the pathway is the patient comes along, we take a history and examine the patient, they have some imaging performed, they have a diagnostic pathology performed, they may have some treatment that induces a toxicity, we may measure things in the blood. We now have these platform technologies to sequence the human genome. We can now look at all the protein components of the genome and ultimately we can make a treatment decision. Right now, we're no further than these three. But all of these things are now becoming in place. And so the challenge now is to bring these practical steps into optimizing this treatment decision. And this is the technology of omics, and uh, it's, it's uh, really important. Um, right from our genome, uh, to the proteins that make the cells and the engines that work the cells, to how our brains and our bodies work, and ultimately to our total of sort of body anatomy. So there are lots of things we can image, and uh, particularly. And we can now start to move from the individual to the actual tumor. And the big problem right now is that even though the tumor is different from anybody else's tumor, each cell within the tumor is different from every other cell. And the evidence for that is, is coming through, and I'll talk to you about it. So conceptually, everybody's different. We may generate or uh, develop similar tumors, but each one of those is going to be different. So when it comes to personalization, we have to take into account the person, their tumor, and ultimately, hopefully, their treatment. Here's some evidence from renal cancer that was recently published in the New England Journal of Medicine, which is a top world journal in, in medicine. And this is a tumor of the kidney. kidney. And uh, this person, unfortunately, developed spread of the tumor. And so uh, the team were able to sequence every single tumor and uh, area and generate a map of how each of those tumor areas related to each other. And what was evident was that even though that person had developed a tumor, each one of these metastatic sites or primary sites was actually quite different from the other. And so the problem is even further magnified. But what we could do is, is rationalize and work out what is common both between people and within the same tumor of an individual. So this means that any, tu any tr targeted treatment, any treatment to the, one of these pathways is unlikely to be successful in every single tumor simply because there's so much heterogeneity. And this is uh, being uh, covered even further at the single cell level, which we'll skip over. So we can start to integrate the genomic information into things we do routinely in the, lab, uh, in the clinic, such as imaging and so on. So there's a huge amount of information that we can collect. The real tr trouble here is how to integrate that information into something clinically useful. So another future priority is how do we integrate imaging, clinical information, genomic information into a treatment plan. So um, I'm going to illustrate the th three, three main bone tumors, osteosarcoma, giant cell tumor of bone, and Ewing sarcoma. I'm going to flick through some slides, very, very, but I'll try and pick out the key take-home messages. Um, so when we've gone to sequence every single gene in osteosarcoma, we found that it's a complete mess, and that every single tumor ha is, has a disintegrated genome. It's called chromothripsis. It's a recent discovery, and it's quite common in osteosarcoma. It makes it very difficult, then, to generate a treatment 
that is going to work for everyone and for every cell in that individual. So we've got to be smarter about what ways we might attack an osteosarcoma because it's, not, it's unlikely it's going to be one drug or two. One way is to attack these immune cells I mentioned before. And this has uh, now happened. And these are cells called macrophages. They're a bit like the dustbin uh, cells of the body. They go around chewing things up and disposing of them. And they can be activated by a number of signals. Uh, and there's two to remember, the M1 and the M2. You want to be on the M1 because that's going to stop the tumour growing, not the M2. And it turns out to be a drug discovered but accidentally. It, it's actually uh, based on a bacterial peptide. And it's uh, part of the response that we'd get to, say, a, a, a pneumonia. And, and it's uh, assembled into a clever sort of uh, little uh, rocket, if you like. And that rockets into the body and is chewed up by these macrophages. Now, if you give uh, young patients with osteosarcoma this drug, one, only one randomized clinical trial uh, was performed that showed that, in fact, if you have the drug after you have resection of, uh, complete resection of osteosarcoma, that the survival is improved if you have this rocket that activates the macrophages. And this was the basis of the NICE uh, approval for Mepact or Mifamortide. Now, the way it works is it's infused, it activates an intracellular receptor called NOD2, it amplifies that signal into, into changes in gene expression, and it produces lots of little immune factors that destroy the tumour. That's how we think it might work. But it turns out that people differ in the way they activate NOD2, how this RIC kinase works, how these genes work, and ultimately what the output is. So even if we gave everybody in this room this drug, we're all going to vary in terms of our response. Now that might mean we might need to give some people a slightly higher dose or slightly lower dose, and it might actually mean that some people don't respond at all. So knowledge, this scientific knowledge, you can't ignore it. It's, it's, it's palpable, it's, ex, it's increasing at an exponential rate, and it's going to transform, we treat all diseases in the end. But this knowledge needs to now come into the clinic to work out, well, you know, who are we giving them to? And if you look in the osteosarcomas, you find that there is quite a big heterogeneity in terms of the number of these macrophages using this marker called CD14 in diagnostic biopsies, post-chemotherapy resections, or even metastatic disease. So the way to attack osteosarcoma might be that we have to think outside the box in terms of targeting the tumour itself with the clever drugs that you might hear about, but to target, they say, the immune system, where it doesn't really matter what's happening within the osteosarcoma, we can start to hit an Achilles heel outside of it. Ewing sarcoma might be slightly different. Even though it's a relatively simple tumour, inverted commas, it's, it's caused by a mistake, a key mistake, EWS fly one translocation. You can pick it up on a biopsy. But actually, it's much more complicated when you go into the detail. Now, these translocations are very important because they make the Ewing sarcoma happen, but they don't necessarily determine whether the patient with a particular type of this mistake um, does worse or, or better. And this is recent data. Uh, in fact, uh, Sue was involved in this sort of study working out what these uh, mistakes were and whether they really influenced outcome. So it must be then other things that are influencing why a Ewing sarcoma is bad or good in terms of treatment. It might be the size of the tumour, its location, how long it took to diagnose, all these factors. But one molecular factor might be what else is going on in the genome. And this is a recent paper which shows a lot of changes in the genome, a bit like the DNA of the osteosarcoma. And one of the pieces of DNA is 1Q, part of a chromosome called 1Q. And if you have that 1Q amplification, uh, it splits the survival. You take everybody with Ewing sarcoma, if you've got the 1Q gain, for some reason the Ewing sarcoma behaves badly. This stuff is not in the clinic yet, but it might help us work out before we start treatments, right, your Ewing sarcoma, how, how is it going to behave? Is it going to be bad, good? What do we have to do? Do we have to intensify your treatment? Do we have to give you other drugs? 
Are we going to have to be very careful about how we treat you? Are there drugs we shouldn't give you? So this information needs to come into the clinic. And the science is critical. Here's another example. 2004, some French scientists, don't worry about the details on this, some French scientists worked out that um, there was one, if you can't target the mistake itself, the EWS fly one mistake, can you target something below it, something that is making, is changing? And this is a pathway that does change. It's called the IGF pathway. And uh, it's a small growth factor that makes us grow. It accounts for our growth as an embryo and uh, the accelerated growth during adolescence. And so this pathway is quite important potentially because it might be making the Ewing sarcoma very sensitive to what happens in our hormonal status during adolescent growth, skeletal growth. But if you activate this little ligand, it activates a number of receptors on the cells that change a signal. Now, if you inhibit just this receptor here, not the, its sister, uh, it seems that there are some patients with Ewing sarcoma who do really well just on this protein treatment every four weeks. And that's a remarkable result, having, as you know, treatment of Ewing sarcoma being very chemotherapy dependent. But unfortunately, uh, for two further trials failed to show any massive changes in outcome, uh, even though it was a smart idea to target that one pathway. And um, both uh, recently published, both about 100 patients in each study, and sadly, the benefits didn't really accrue into long-term outcome benefits. Now, why was that? Well, one possibility was, in fact, there was a mistake made, intellectually a mistake made. They targeted just one receptor, not both, and this is a fit bypass pathway. So there is one drug in the world that hits both pathways. It's called OSI906, so one of the research priorities I'm particularly interested in is actually making sure that we test this drug in Ewing sarcoma and not give up understanding this Achilles heel potentially. Giant cell tumors of bone, quite rare, can be quite difficult to treat, usually done by surgery. But here's an example of a drug developed, in fact, for osteoporosis, age-related osteoporosis, thinning of bones. Um, it targets a, a, a little protein called rankle. And uh, again, it's, a, it's an injection under the skin. Uh, you don't need to be in hospital having chemotherapy. It doesn't make you sick. Um, it's uh, just a few injections and uh, in a difficult tumor sometimes. And a small trial was done in a very small number of patients. You don't have to do thousands of trials, patients in trials if you've got a very active drug. 90% of the patients responded it was a fantastic response. So it, the giant cell tumors are made of giant cells, and these are called giant cell osteoclasts, and they make this rankle. And if you inhibit it with the, with the treatment, uh, the, the osteoclasts disappear. This is a PET scan showing the bone of the this, of this spine, the sacrum, involved with the tumor. And this is a radioactive glucose going into the tumor. It's very hungry, this tumor. And it's a good marker for its activity. And if you give the antibody treatment under the skin, patient comes in, antibody treatment goes home, a few weeks later, shuts down the tumor. And, and what it does, in fact, is it changes the behavior of the tumor so that it starts to behave, behave like a benign growth and it starts to calcify up and get firmer and actually, hopefully, will improve the surgical outcome. Still early days with denosumab, but potentially a quite an interesting <clears throat> molecule that may have relevance in osteosarcoma and Ewing sarcoma. But here's a drug that's relatively cheap. So, prevention early diagnosis. So, some guys in the laboratory discovered that uh, there's this very important pathway called P53. And it turns out that some people inherit a mutation of P53 and develop early onset sarcomas. That's very rare. But there are actually a significant proportion of us that have a subtle change, something you wouldn't necessarily pick up that easily. And it's in a, for one, if you want to know, it's in a SNP, a single nucleotide polymorphism of a gene called MDM2, a promoter of a gene called MDM2. So this detail is very important because then we understand how this pathway works. But what it means is that you don't have to have the mutation, you can just have some subtle abnormality, and it still increases your risk of getting a, an early onset sarcoma. And this was proven in the lab, and 
And what the, what the implications of this? Well, this is a really, really, really important experiment done by David Malkin from Canada. Uh, so Lee Fraumini patients have the p53 mutation that predisposes to early onset sarcomas, mainly soft tissue but some osteosarcomas. If you screen these patients very carefully with ultrasound scans and MRI scans, and you're really diligent about trying to pick up where these tumors happen, uh, and he did this in a, a sort of randomized fashion, he found that all those that he surveyed survived. All those that were thrown into the normal routine follow-up and care that's available to all of us, non-personalized care, they died, and they died because the tumors were picked up late, uh, they weren't screened, they didn't go through a rapid access diagnostic pathway, and so this model in a, such a rare, rare syndrome is a template to try to understand that if we could identify the genomic mistakes that might predispose you to getting osteosarcoma, it won't be 100%, it may be only 10% risk in your whole lifetime, but that might be enough to label, give you an opportunity to, to have a screening investigation that might prevent you getting at least advanced disease, may not cure. So just want to end then. So the future directions have to surround the patient. What are those key questions? And we're going to have a debate about that this afternoon. The prediction. Can we use these wonderful new technologies? This is a revolution in genomics. Uh, we can now sequence the genome in about uh, three days. It's, uh, there's a little company here in Oxford called Oxford Nanopore that's made a genome sequencer the size of a USB stick that can do it in 15 minutes. The technology is li unlimited, but it's the interpretation and the application of the data. So understanding as an individual, whether your risk is high or low for any particular condition is prediction. The next big question is, well, can you do anything about it apart from screening? Well, that's a very sensible thing, but are there preventative treatments you can introduce? Then if you do unfortunately get the disease, can we use this technology to really personalize your treatment, to make it better, to give you less toxicity and enhance your chances of survival? And in all of these processes, this is the key part, that uh, this is not about the scientists and the medical profession and the government. This is about us as a population and, our, and as patients, potential patients. We have to define this game. And without that, we will never achieve any of these objectives. So I'll finish there. Thank you. Thank you.